So again, thank you for joining us for today's event, Role of Rural Libraries in Promoting Digital Health Literacy, presented by Diane Connery, Director of Pottsboro Library in Texas. This event is being hosted by the Colorado State Library. My name is Christy Moran. She, Aya, are my pronouns. And I am the Adult Library Services Senior Consultant, or as I like to say, uh, a librarian for the librarians and library staff in Colorado. Today's event will be recorded, and it's being recorded, and all the registrants will receive an email with a link to the recording. Additionally, at the end of this presentation and in that follow-up email, I'll be sharing a link to a survey. The State Library uses this survey to inform our work and to report on the value of our programming. And now I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Diane. Hello, thank you. All right, let me get this going here. Um, I am Diane Connery. I am in Pottsboro, Texas. And we're a little bitty town of about 2,300 within city limits. You can see the map on the right. We're sort of halfway between Dallas and Oklahoma City. And just by way of background, um, I had never lived in a rural community and I had no library experience except, you know, personal experience when I was younger. 2010 moved to this community and I did not want to meet anyone or volunteer or work. I just wanted to enjoy my view of the lake. And uh, shortly thereafter was invited to a board meeting here at the library. And the discussion was how many months left um, of funding did they have before they would need to close because the library received no taxpayer funding. Um, it was all donation, all volunteer. The volunteers were aging out and um, they had 14 months left uh, of money. And so uh, I, I love ideas and I love innovation. And it looked to me like a no lose proposition because if the library was going to close anyway, then um, what if I experimented? If it's still closed, we weren't any worse off. Um, but luckily, here I am, um, 2023, and our library has really become the hub of the community. And so I'll just share sort of a mishmash of some of the programs we have going on. Um, my Initial interest was um, digital inclusion because not having lived in a rural area when I moved here, I saw how many people didn't have internet in their homes, didn't know how to use computers. And I really thought like, how are the kids ever going to make it in life if they don't understand um, how to use this? So the advantage we have, and I will tell you, was it, it, this is a huge double-edged sword, but our advantage was we had no money. We had no funding. And the reason that was an advantage was the flip side of it is we've had no bureaucracy. If we could patch together the money, we had the freedom to do what we wanted without um, you know, having to request the city's approval or that sort of um, thing. So uh, our all-in budget, actually, this, this slide's a little old, our all-in operating budget this year is uh, $39,000, and that's utilities, that's the, the janitor, that's computers, that's salaries, that's everything before grants and donations is 39,000. And I recognize that each of our libraries um, it is different. While we share some similarities, there's a lot that's different too. So your mileage may vary. Um, what you're interested in doing and have the capacity to do in your community may be very different than mine, but our starting point was um, obviously um, it was not sustainable to go without paid staff and without 
some sort of taxpayer funding. So our first thought was, how do we become so important to the community that then if we close, people will be up in arms? And there were people in the community that liked the, the uh, philosophy of having a library, but very, very few people in the town used it. And, and frankly, um, young people were not welcome at our library. They were, they were um, shooting out our windows with paintball guns and graffiti, that kind of thing. Um, and, and the books hadn't been checked out in, you know, literally 15 years in a lot of cases. So what we have here is a lake community, Lake Texoma, um, and a lot of people buy lake homes here, come up on the weekends from Dallas and Fort Worth, and then retire um, here. But a lot of that is with the understanding as they need more services, they'll have to move back to a city because we're so rural, we don't have a lot of those services. And so what we have come up with is kind of a focus, like how can we change the economy in our area, help people age in place, help people reach their aspirations. And so some of what I say will go beyond what is the traditional scope of the library, but I knew that if I was going to go to the city at budget time and say, give the library some money, we were competing against the needs of the fire department and the police station and the water plant and sewer plant and all that kind of stuff. So in our case, the city felt like they didn't have enough and they didn't have enough money to, um, to fund what they called quality of life services. So things like summer reading would not stand up against, um, you know, the firemen had uniforms, the volunteer fire department had uniforms that we're expiring and we're no longer fire retardant. So we knew we needed to provide essential services. So that was start of our um, part of our starting place. And so we were always, uh, I would say from 2012 on, we were really focused on getting people connected to the internet. Um, that's what a lot of people come to our library for. Not so much um, check out books or, or book circulation is pretty low, but people come here for help with digital skills, with technology help, um, and, and for connectivity. What COVID taught me, and this was a huge um, aha moment for me, is that there are all these regional and even national organizations and funding sources that part of their mission is serving rural communities, but they didn't have the gateway to meet these people that they wanted to serve. And so as a rural librarian, I am helping them reach their mission because um, I can introduce them to the people and set up programs, but I have so little capacity that I really depend on partners to, to make that happen. So I mentioned this year are all in operating budgets, 39,000, and that that includes salary. So that salary um, is paid. We have a one paid staff member, and it's not me, but one paid staff member is paid for 27 hours a week. Um, and then we find grant funding to fund other positions on top of that. And our desk worker is a federal program, uh, SC, SEP, Senior Community Engagement Program. So our desk worker is an older adult who wanted to learn some job skills and get back in the, the job market. But so what COVID taught me is there are all these really smart people with a lot of ideas and researchers wanting to know how to engage rural communities, and I can help them do that, and you can help them do that um, if, if you're interested and that fits your um, mission. So broadband and equity, um, 
people in rural communities have an 11 year shorter life expectancy in some cases than people in um, cities and in, in more populated cities. And they consider digital inclusion, broadband connectivity as a super social determinant of health. Whatever your problem is, it is made worse if you do not have connectivity. So when COVID shut down the schools, I reached out to the schools and asked them which of the, the students did not have internet at home. And one of my first surprises was the number of teachers who did not have internet at home. And they provided this map to me with the blue markers. Um, and actually the story is much worse than this map shows because this was created early on and what we discovered later and the school discovered that a lot of people thought that they had connectivity um, sufficient for their needs and it wasn't. They may have had you know, a data plan on their phone that they could use as a hotspot, but to put two kids on that and you know, parent trying to work and it is not robust enough and there are cap, data cap limits, that sort of thing. So the, the blue markers you see are in our school district, the kids who initially um, thought that they didn't have connectivity at home. So one of our early um, steps we took, well, you'll see us, the green marker down kind of the lower right is where the library is located. And one of the huge issues in our area is lack of transportation. Um, there is no public transportation and there's no ride sharing. And a shocking to me, um, number of people don't have cars. So um, we knew that not everybody could come to the library to um, sit in our parking lot or you know come inside to use the, the Wi-Fi. So we set up, we call them neighborhood access stations, um, the yellow, orange, and uh, purple are these neighborhood access stations, the tackle shop, volunteer fire department, that sort of thing. So we pet, set up permanent hotspots, hopefully within walking distance of um, where people could get to. And one of the free resources that was so generous to us, um, ITDRC, Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, is a national nonprofit, and they've got the hardware, um, and they've got the expertise, will come in for free. And so they set, they uh, immediately, within days of my request, drove a hotspot trailer to a hotel outside of town that's near some apartments and parked their trailer. And then we have pictures of like families coming and sitting around that trailer to do their, their schoolwork. Typically, ITDRC goes in after major disasters, um, wildfires in Northern California. I think they said there were 14,000 homes without internet access, or they'll go in after a hurricane, flood, that kind of thing. But um, they had the expertise, the equipment. All they asked for was, where do you want me to park the trailer? You know, who needs help? And so... Um, that was one of our early things. We also reached out to businesses and asked who was willing, businesses and churches, who was willing to take password protection off their internet connections um, so that people could, could park there. The ultimate answer is to get connectivity in people's homes. It's not to sit outside, even if it's close to their home. And so that's a big push. You know, all this uh, federal money, the bead money that's that's coming out. And some of that is slated for um, teaching digital skills. So we are really going all in with a, a local internet provider to apply for some of that money. And we actually, as a library um formed the for our county the the broadband coalition because nobody else was doing it and what we are told in Texas is once that money becomes available they want the projects that have a plan and are ready to go that's who they're going to start funding 
Um, so if you don't have a coalition in your town and broadband access is a problem, um, I encourage you to start reaching out to other stakeholders who are interested in the same topic. So digital health inclusion, everyone should have fair and just opportunity to engage with and benefit from digital health tools. More and more is moving online. And I'll talk some about telemedicine, but there are also things that are much more basic than that, just having email. I went to the dentist um, recently and they have you know, my explanation of benefits from the insurance company, I had to log in there to see how that was used. Their monitoring devices, um, just as simple as apps on your phone for, well, now I have an, an Apple watch, which does a lot for me, but, you know, um, meditation apps, that sort of thing. So there's a lot that we can do to help people with um, their connectivity now that um, so many things are moving online, more and more healthcare is moving online. So we stayed open when the shutdown happened because we understood so many people in our community needed access to the internet. One of the first um, people to approach us was a veteran who said he had always called for refills, but um, the phone lines were swamped and there weren't workers um, at that time in the veterans hospital to take the calls, that it all became online, that it had to be done. And um, so we had people like that come in and we could help them with refills. One of the, um, and by the way, Veterans Administration was way ahead of, of any other organization I've heard in, in telemedicine and telehealth services. And they really have gone into some, I want to say Wyoming, but various rural places and set up hubs in places like um, the Lions Club or VFW, that sort of thing. Um, so I used a lot of my initial uh, information gathering was based on what they did. We also had, if you remember, um, to, to get some of the benefits, people had to go online. And um, one gentleman um, called me in tears, and he had been a dishwasher at a hotel on the lake um, that shut down with the pandemic. He needed to file for uh, benefits, and he came in and showed me his phone. He had called 143 times that morning to try to get through on the phone, could not do it, and his message said, Diane, I've never touched a computer before in my life. Can you help me? He came in, and within an hour, it's like the check is in the mail. It is on the way to you, um, and he was eternally grateful. Um, and then one of the other um, early on people we had COVID, somebody had had an MRI, they were having neurological symptoms right before the shutdown. The neurologist contacted her after he um, read, read the MRI and said he needed to talk to her, but she was too high risk to come in to the office that he wanted to do it online. And um, so at that time in our library, we're basically, it's about 3,200 square feet. It's an old 1965 post office. The only private room that we had available was my office. So I put her in my office on my laptop and was able to get her um, connected. So that was, um, you know, just a clear indication of the need was there. Um, and so next thing that happened is National Library of Medicine. I contacted them and said, uh, but it, I, I looked for some grants and they had a COVID grant. And I think this ended up being one of National Library of Medicine's first grant um, was to establish a telemedicine room in our library. And that's where I am coming to you from now. See the, the blue panels in the back are sound absorbing panels. It um, had been 
a, a weeding room, you know, all those books that people donate that have mud daubers and spider webs and they're yellow and they were National Geographics or encyclopedias. You know, we would put what we could into the trash or donate them to the thrift shop. Um, but there were books in here that had been in here for many, many years. So National Library of Medicine um, generously agreed to um, fund us with $20,000 to convert this room into telemedicine. Um, if you're familiar with a lot of grants, they won't pay construction costs, so they wouldn't pay everything. And for instance, one of the stacks of books I removed, at the bottom of the stack, there was a smashed frog in it. And this felt the old carpet. So we knew we had to take that up. Um, and, and we painted and put in HVAC system, that sort of thing. Um, but we also reached out to our community. And we have built such good um, relationship with our community members that when we say we have a need, um, people are there so quickly to help us meet that need. A couple summers ago, our air conditioner um, went out and the city didn't own the building at that time. The Friends of the Library did. And we needed $18,000 to put in a new unit. And within four days, we had $18,000 and able to, to re-up. So I could understand when we started talking about this telemedicine room, I could understand our end of what that would look like, what the room needed to look like. It needed to have a hardwired computer so it would be fast. I did some research. They said lighting is important. So I got lighting panels. Um, I could understand that piece of it. But what I couldn't figure out was how do we prevent double booking this room? You know, if three people at home go to their individual providers and say, okay, Tuesday morning at 10, and then they come in here, that's not going to work. So it so happens in our region, the National Library of Medicine is housed on the campus with University of North Texas Health Science Center and Safer Care Texas, which is um, a government uh, uh, agency of how to um, prevent preventable harm. And so I think literally over the water cooler, the National Library of Medicine people were talking to the Health Science Center people and, and said, hey, let's get on a call. Well, I um, am very flexible, pivot quickly, fly by the seat of my pants. Hospital systems do not fly by the seat of their pants. So what happened was um, several months of Zoom calls with disinfection protocols and um, logistics, how those appointments would be made. And um, marketing, what would that look like? Because I'm in a town with no newspaper. Um, there's a TV station in a nearby town, but what would any of that look like? And we made some mistakes, spoiler alerts, which I'll, I'll talk to you um, later, but it was invaluable to me. So the way it works in our situation and different libraries around the country do this differently but two days a week, um, the Health Science Center hosts appointments here, and they happen to be in Fort Worth, which is two hours away. People, if they want an appointment, call the Health Science Center directly, schedule the appointment, um, arrange whatever payment, and they do Medicare, Medicaid, uh, most insurance plans, and private pay. They take care of all of that. And then the day before the appointment, the Health Science Center emails me and says, okay, Diane, tomorrow you have appointments at 9.30 and 12.30. So I am prepared to greet them and provide as much technical assistance as the, the patient needs. And so this is what it looks like. Um, on the bottom left there, you'll see it's a HEPA filter that runs. It so happens in our situation, I, it was perfect because we happen to have an outdoor entrance. Um, if you remember the beginning of COVID, nobody knew really what this thing was. Um, so we were scheduling appointments when no one else was in the main 
uh, building of the library and people could come in to this virtual health room from the outside. It actually has a, a ring doorbell that I can greet people with. And there's also an iPad kiosk because, you know, when you go to the library, there's all that paperwork that you have to do in advance. So um, once people schedule an appointment, they can either come and use our public computers and we could help them if they need fill out that paperwork or they could come early to their appointment and on the iPad outside by the parking lot, they could um, fill out that, that paperwork. Um, just a couple of things to note here that we do have blood pressure cuff, pulse oximeter, which some people borrowed that, by the way, um, during the, the pandemic, scale, uh, thermometer, um, gloves. We, we have lots and lots of the disinfectant that the um, Health Science Center provided. Um, but I will tell you, when I started, before we really got this up and running. First of all, I, I looked our other libraries doing telemedicine. I couldn't find anybody. And when I was talking to our local libraries, um, the pushback I was getting was that they did not want to encourage people who uh, had communicable diseases to come to the library. That, um, you know, I felt comfortable with, with the disinfection protocols that we had in place. There were a lot of HIPAA concerns, which have been resolved to our state library's satisfaction. Um, and mainly that is, and I am not an attorney, so do your own <laughs> research, but um, our state library had an attorney. They'll never say anything as an absolute, but what they said is probably what will happen Um is that we are an exception as a library. We're merely a conduit to the appointment. We are not storing, saving any of that health information. We are providing an internet connection, which could have happened at any of your libraries all along. People could have come in to the public computers and connected with their doctors. Um, with an abundance of caution, I will say there is a national working group about telemedicine and they had an attorney on and he wasn't quite so sure that the conduit exception applied. His feeling was that you should at least get um, a, a consent thing, uh, uh, have users sign a consent saying that it would be possible for outsiders to um, get into the connection and look at their, you know, private doctor's appointment. So I did not um, personally take their blood pressure or anything like that. Um, I did throughout this process through Net Medical Library Association um, take their consumer health information specialization courses. It will be paid for. Um, it's free to you through National Library of Medicine. There are two levels. They call it CHIS-1 and CHIS-2. So just for people who may not be comfortable um, at answering reference questions um, about medicine, that provides some um, comfort and some um, confidence building. And they have National Library of Medicine has lots and lots of free courses you can take online. And I just want to step back here and say, again, this is scalable to all types of libraries. You don't have to be providing blood pressure cuffs. You don't have to be even facilitating the telemedicine appointments. Maybe your first step could be providing a link on your public computer to some authoritative health resources. National Library of Medicine um, has Medline Plus. That's my go-to. Um, if somebody has a, an appointment, let's say, and the doctor says, you know, I, I think that um, you may have gout, and then the person has questions for me, how can I learn more about gout after that appointment? I'm comfortable taking them to Medline Plus and helping them search 
through those resources for more information because librarians are health information specialists. We've always respected privacy. We've helped with um, technology since the beginning. So to me, this makes so much sense. A lot of times we have the fastest internet connection in town. Um, you'll see I have a large print keyboard there. The desk raises and lowers to accommodate wheelchairs. Um, and it is, it's a, a private space. One of the unexpected learnings I had was some people do have connectivity in their home and they know how to use the computer fine, but they don't have a private space in their homes. So um, for instance, we have somebody um, who works in an office nearby. She wanted to do appointments on her lunch hour rather than drive 30 minutes to the nearest um, town. She can come here literally in two minutes and um, have the, the telemedicine appointment in this private space that she wasn't comfortable doing in her office. So there have been a lot of um, findings from that. By the way, American Heart Association, and I think Christy may have a connection uh, for you with that, but they are interested in donating blood pressure cuffs to libraries all over the country. Um, they gave us two, would give us more if we wanted, um, and we check them out for three weeks at a time. There's a short like minute, 30 second video people can watch from the American Heart Association, proper technique for taking their blood pressure. Then they have a log that they can go home and for three weeks at a time, log their blood pressure. And because I had mentioned that we don't have um, transportation here, I will tell you, we have a man who has cardiovascular disease who rides his bicycle to the library um, to use our telehealth room to monitor his um, heart disease and connect with, with doctors. And that is a benefit we could provide and um, I think quite possibly um, keep him healthier through this service we're providing um, because there are health disparities between rural areas and their urban counterparts. And there is some research that suggests connectivity is one of the contributing factors. Remember in uh, early COVID, or at least in Texas, the only way to um, make an appointment to get a vaccine was on online. And so that's the sort of thing we do, we're doing. Now, very fortunate through the Texas State Library, I got a grant to hire a community health worker, um, a lay person embedded in the community. He does lots of uh, health education outreach at the VFW, American Legion Senior Center, and he also facilitates these um, virtual health appointments. So um, one of the things that we learned was um, a lot of people, this is such a duh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit it, but a lot of people don't like going to the doctor and mostly the people we were trying to attract um, were not people who were comfortable with technology. So we were trying to say, hey, do these two things you don't like to do together at a place that you would have never guessed um, <laughs> has the service available, the library. Um, and so one woman who used our services, um, she's 78 years old. And um, afterwards, she told me that the mailer that we had sent to every zip code in um, our county, I mean, every house in our zip code, which is a big expense for a small library, the the image on it was a close-up of a laptop with a mask laying across it. And what that woman taught me, it is not the technology that matters, it's the human connection that they wanted, she wanted to know that there was somebody who would be patient and non-judgmental and friendly 
who would help her through this appointment when she didn't even really understand what telemedicine was. So on the left there, you see we had door hangers that we literally went door to door in our community and put these door hangers up so that people could could hopefully meet us if they were home um, and see that it was a real person. And then we learned from our local ISD that one of the big um, needs that they identified was behavioral health appointments. So we also have a partnership with a behavioral health group People can come here. There's no stigma about parking at the library. Um, and some libraries in Central Texas are doing amazing work on um, peer support specialists and um, people who have lived experience with behavioral health issues in, in their libraries. It's just, just really fascinating stuff. So um, I mentioned the Medical Library Association and the Consumer Health Information Specialization. There's a slide on that, uh, got ahead of myself. And then National Library of Medicine, they now have a course on um, how to launch uh, telemedicine, what you need to know in your library to make it happen. But gosh, they have so many really worthwhile courses. Some of them are one-offs and a one hour. Some are eight-week courses. I cannot recommend highly enough. And so um, I'm always on the lookout for things. I, I mentioned, I think that we got a consent form from our regional telehealth resource center. Every region has a telehealth resource center. Um, and so we just used theirs. And then Harvard School of Public Health. I saw in some listserv that they said, hey, send us any health-related documentation you have as a nonprofit and let our health literacy people look over it and we'll give you some feedback. And <laughs> so they looked at that form and um, one of the sentences was from the Telehealth Resource Center, the likelihood of this transmission being intercepted by persons other than those at the consulting site is extremely small. Their suggestion was the chance of this information being seen by people who do not work on my healthcare team is very low. So I've become fascinated in um, health literacy and so that's become a new passion of mine. Like, do people even understand? Do people even understand what telehealth is or telemedicine? So there's lots of work to do. So we have digital navigators or technology helpers. Um, and uh, sometimes in libraries, we offer things that we think people would uh, clamor for in this case. Um, that has not been the case. We've run TV commercials on the noon news in that local town, and our digital navigator is overwhelmed. He goes to uh, senior living facilities. He actually, and probably shouldn't do this, but he does. Somebody gets a new printer. He goes to their home and helps them set it up. Um, one woman who is working for a nonprofit with a um, for veterans who had PTSD, brought in her 10-year-old computer and asked Mark's help to get it up and running so she could do the work for the, the nonprofit. And um, he said, no, it's hopeless. You, you need a new computer. But fortunately, through an incredibly generous grant we have through Google.org and National Digital Inclusion Alliance, we have funding that we can give away devices. So we were able to give her a new laptop and then she meets with um, Mark frequently. He loaded it up for her, got it set up and any questions she has, um, the technology assistance is available for free. So um, if you have not looked into National Digital Inclusion Alliance, they are just, I think, the gold standard in digital inclusion work um, in the U.S. and lots of free resources. So we have the banner in front of our building. We have more door hangers. We had mailers. 
We had yard signs. Um, so much of it is word of mouth. We, um, you know, do these outreach meetings more and more. What I see is it is word of mouth. <laughs> As a funny aside, at our um, our, our the biggest fundraiser we do each year is an annual luncheon. We have about a hundred um, people come. And this year I was able to wow them with artificial intelligence because it was stuff people had heard, but didn't know how it could do, what it could do, that sort of thing. But the funny part was people were fighting, calling the library, like bidding on having our digital navigator sit at their table. Um, one woman bought a thousand dollar table. And so Mark sat <laughs> at her table. I just, he, he's great. Okay, so <laughs> digital health literacy, um, North Star Digital Literacy has some free resources for you. Um, some of them are curriculum, so people for free can come to your library, log into their website and take these free classes. And then some, they have assessments. So one of their newer ones is accessing telehealth appointments you see with the arrow there on the right. So if you were interested maybe in offering some training, that would be a good place to start to look at what do people need to know. And it's, it's platform agnostic. It's not one specific platform. It's just in general, what do people need to know to access telehealth? Medical providers were saying that there were people spending a lot of time um, on these appointments early on, like, okay, how do you unmute and where do you point your camera, that sort of thing. And that assessment will help um, guide you through some of that so that the appointment time is spent much more efficiently. Um, a simulation lab, again, with trying to change the economy of our area and build entrepreneurs, one of the things we did, again, through a grant, we were able to hire 15 teenage digital navigators, and we brought them in. They had three weeks of digital navigator training. How do you help someone set up an email account, that sort of thing? How do you print from the computer? sort of general things. Um, and then for the fourth week, we had a hospital come in um, and bring in their simulation lab, frankly, to build empathy and understanding because these are intergenerational digital navigators. So on the left there, you see the goggles. I think there's cataract, macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic eye, um, but it can be done just with like Vaseline on reading glasses. But so they got to experience like, okay, help this person with macular degeneration set up an email account. What does that experience look like for them? Or if they can't bend their neck, you know, have the seat collar, whatever it is on their neck. What is that like? Upper right, we had them put on some thin gardening gloves and we had colored beads and said, pretend these are pills and sort these into your pill minder for the week and button up your shirt and um, experience what that, you know, loss of sensation or fine motor skills is like, or if you have arthritic hands and you can't bend your, your fingers as well, what is that like? And lower right was um, it's software, uh, free software online that you can experience various levels of um, hearing disabilities in various settings. So here's what it would moderate would be like in a restaurant. Here's what it's like in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or at a sports arena, that sort of thing. At the end of the day, we did, um, took up sticky notes to a, like a, ask the teens what's a takeaway they had um, for the day. And one of the teens, I just loved him so much, said, um, he has a newfound appreciation for his grandfather, his grandpa, because his grandpa can't see or hear well, but he can haul hay like nobody's business. And, and the teens just talked about how they would be tired before they ever got out of the house if, if things in their life were, were so difficult. So um, I am hoping we can develop some services in our area 
so people can stay and age in their homes. Um, to that end, another free resource, Senior Planet is a subdivision of AARP. There are free classes people can go online and take, um, like the Internet of Things. And so not only do they have these free classes that people can take, they have a free 800 um, technology helpline that people can call and just say, how do I get on a Zoom appointment or whatever your issue may be? So that's a free service funded by AARP. One of the classes I offered here was how to turn your house into a smart home. There are so many fairly low tech things people can use in their homes to help them uh, age in place, which most people want to do. One example is a ring doorbell. So if you're having a medication delivered that requires a signature, but you are slow getting to the door, if you have a ring doorbell, when the delivery person knocks or rings, you can say, hey, I'm coming, please wait, I'm on my way or my mother in Georgia has a virtual assistant that if she doesn't check in by 9 a.m. every morning, it notifies me because uh, typically she'll get up and say, what's the weather going to be or turn on music, that kind of thing. So I get a notification that for some reason she hasn't checked in. I know to call her or there are all these smart light bulbs or smart plugs so that somebody doesn't maybe have to lean over behind a chair to turn a lamp off that they could use that. So lots of um, ideas of how people can stay in their homes longer. South Carolina way above me or ahead of me with getting community health workers into um, their libraries and the community health workers just to help connect people to the resources that they they need. And then one of those services they provide is um, telemedicine, but that's that's not all that they provide. It's, you know, helping people with those other social determinants of health. And so I don't want to leave this out. Now I'm trying to talk faster and faster. Um, <laughs> February 2021, we had um, a disaster th really throughout the state of Texas. Our power grid was down for up to seven days. And in our community, what that did was also shut off um, water. And I had never really thought about that. But start thinking about if you did not have water for bathing, washing dishes, flushing toilets, brushing your teeth, cooking, for seven days, what would that look like? And the library happens to be in a lower income um, section of town with some housing authority apartments nearby. There wasn't, at the bottom left, you can see that was the extent of our snow. So it wasn't like the snow was real deep, but people were being told in the beginning, shovel snow, put that in your toilet tanks. Um, to flush your toilets. Well, around apartment buildings, within a day or two, all that snow was gone. Keep in mind, we don't have newspaper. There are not a lot of methods of communication. The library, we are great at connecting people. So we started bringing together people. Um, one of the, the groups we got was ranchers outside of town who had wells who would bring water to town. Some of that was suitable for drinking, some was not. So first we set the, their trucks up at the library and said, bring your coolers, bring your pitchers, bring whatever, um, and come to the library to get water. But water is heavy. Um, if they couldn't do that, then we had the ranchers um, go around and park in various places around town. And we had volunteers who would knock go door to door and say, bring bring your um, containers down, get water. One woman opened her door. She had this huge, fresh um, surgical incision on her chest. Come to find out she had had uh, open heart surgery and she was gonna drag her cooler down from the second story to the truck and then drag it up full of water. Of course, we didn't let that happen, um, but people are so vulnerable and 
that was a big takeaway that it could take in small towns a long time for first responders to get to us. We had to be our own helpers until responders could get to us because they were busy in more populated city and we were kind of on our own. One of the um, local restaurants, because her refrigerator freezer didn't have power, her food was going to go bad. She said, if you'll bring me well water to cook with and to wash dishes with, I'll cook for the community. She made a hundred meals, which we passed out um, in the community. So, so people are so good. Um, so many people want to help, but there were a lot of people angry in the community and um, at, at the lack of what our local government, which has limited capacity, they felt like the local government should have been taking care of all these things. And frankly, the city manager was out shoveling, fixing broken water pipes because we don't have a big public works department, et cetera. So we were kind of in this funny position of we had been very helpful. The community was so grateful to us. But um, ultimately, the city is now uh, one of our main funding sources. And so we wanted to bring the community together, community conversation, and look at what can we do going forward. Let's not talk blame. How can we um, be positive about this? So we reached out to Office of Emergency Management. They um, provided a very intensive nine-week training for citizens um, everything from how to tie a tourniquet to clear buildings that have been destroyed by tornadoes and, you know, a train derailment, landslide, all kinds of just amazing stuff, how to use a fire extinguisher. Turns out I didn't know that. Um, and so we started building this network in Pottsboro of citizens who, in a disaster, the Emer Office of Emergency Management will call us. If it is safe for us to do so, we will respond. But a lot of it is about ch neighbors checking on neighbors. I will say um, Web Junction has some awesome resources about disaster response, like um, work that New Jersey State Library did in response to hurricanes. Um, so there are a lot of resources out there. Um, Web Junction would be a good place to start. And the Rural Health um, Information Hub has stuff to, let's see. Now that's not letting me forward. But I know I'm coming to the end of my time. Christy, let me see if I had any more. Oh, no, that's why it's not letting me forward. That was the last slide. <laughs> Yay. Um, I will just say um, quickly, I am working with our Council of Governments in a three county area. Um, what can libraries in small towns do in case of disaster? How can libraries help small businesses be resilient and get up and running again? Um, there's so many partnerships and that uh, that I'll leave you with that of um, just build ongoing cross sector relationships. Don't wait till there's a problem. Don't wait until there's a grant available and you're looking for uh, somebody to collaborate with. Uh, build these partnerships now. All right, Christy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. Um, for those that don't know, Diane has done a similar presentation. I saw this presentation or a version of it from the National Library of Medicine, and I said, we need that. And so much of what she has shared today, uh, Kieran, uh, small and rural libraries consultant and myself, have worked on because Diane has shared this. But you are free to reach out to us. Uh, I know Diane is always open um, as a resource as well. Um, but to find out what it is that we've got going on both in the digital literacy space, digital inclusion space, and in the health literacy and rural health uh, literacy space. Um, please, we have a few minutes left. Um, we can stay a little longer if we have questions to ask. Uh, we do want to respect your time. So uh, does anybody have any questions? You can absolutely put the questions or thoughts. You can put them in the chat. Since we're recording, if you are, do not want to ask aloud, uh, I will read your question aloud. Um, so we can capture it. So any questions? 
while we're waiting, Christy, I did want to mention something else. Um, and, and it does uh, particularly apply to rural areas. Uh, OCLC has been doing a project with American Library Association on the opioid crisis um, in America, and they're coming out with a toolkit for libraries to use. And one of the things I hadn't realized was that how um, it in, improperly disposing of drugs uh, affects our water resources, it ends up, we're all septic tank, which ends up <laughs> and then flows into our lake. And so proper drug disposal. So I've gotten these um, drug disposal kits, but we're now doing um, information around how to properly dispose of drugs so it doesn't impact the environment. That's awesome. Um, so yet another thing I'm going to have to write down <laughs> to be able to support everybody with, always with Diane. Um, I don't see anybody asking any questions or um, putting in any comments. I am then going to go ahead and put in the survey link um, so you could tell us uh, what you think. In the meantime, of course, if you have any questions, please chime in. Um, Diane will be open to answering them. All right. So we're at 11.59. Um, Chelsea, who is great at assessing <laughs> Chelsea, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Oh yeah, Janet. I'll go to oh, yeah, same. Hard. <laughs> I will also go to any webinar Diane does. <laughs> Thank you.